I will be very fast in my speech because I want to let uh, Mario and Maria do the talking. Uh, they are data scientists uh, in our company. Our company started about uh, three years ago. It was 2016 and we were born in H5. It is an incubator and acceleration uh, accelerator in uh, near Venice. It was really a beautiful place in order to start our journey because we were able to build our technology. Since the, since the day one, we combine chatbot and artificial intelligence in order to bridge the gap between businesses and people. So since the, the day one, we all together started to work on this technology. And this is all of the guys that are working here uh, at Indigo. And we are really beautiful people, we are really nice. And this is what we do. So we have built this natural language processing framework that let every business do the talking. So we let them uh, automate the customer care, for instance, or engage people over time. Uh, the interesting part that is our technology is uh, built in-house. So we do a lot of research and we have a really a huge data science team that is able to deal with the best-in-class technology. So. We, uh, from the day one, we aim to set the industry benchmark customer after customer for natural language processing. So we are working with some of the most innovative businesses in the world, such as Vaya, Rayman, Ricom, Rally Mutua, Huffington Post, and SuperD. All of them, they are really different projects, but they have one thing in common, our technology. So our natural language processing framework. So let's start with the talk. I'm really happy to be here, but I... Uh, okay, thank you Gianluca. Uh, brief disclaimer, this will be a very, very technical talk and we will talk mostly about deep learning and now, now I will show you why. So yeah, feel free to interrupt us because the, the subjects we are talking about is really difficult and to explain it is not a trivial task. So yeah, please ask questions even interrupting because it's good for, the, for everybody. Uh, okay, problem. Okay, so uh, the, the slide says that deep learning loves NLP and vice versa. And this is a chart to show you how many papers in top natural language processing like ACML, empirical method in NLP and others were talking actually about new deep learning architecture. As we can see, in 2017, all these four conferences that are the most quoted conferences about NLP worldwide talk about 70% about deep learning. So it is important if you want to do NLP to do deep learning. Uh, very briefly, if you are not familiar with deep learning, let me tell you the big difference between traditional machine learning that was done until like 2005, 2008, and deep learning. And what does it mean with when we talk about sentences? So traditional machine learning uh, has handcrafted hand crafted features. So it means that somebody, like the data scientist, uh, has a bunch of data, like texts or images, if you're talking about images, and needs to think about what are good features to extract from data, and if these features are good enough for a powerful classifier or whatever model you are trained to learn from those features. And, okay, the, so this is the first big downside of traditional machine learning that you need to put a lot of effort in data crunching and data management, which is time you are taking away from the real research part. And also if you are dealing with sequence models, they are really difficult to deal with with traditional machine learning. Like there are conditional random things that do that, but the math behind it is really hard to understand uh, and also really hard to implement. On the other side, there is deep learning, which is what we are talking about today. And the main revolution, I think, about deep learning is that it starts from raw data, from images, for example, from, like, bare, from sentences, and it learns the representation automatically. So it does the whole processing part of selecting features by itself and learns the classifier on top of those features. So it's a whole, uh, it's a unique <coughs> forward pass from raw data to classify. So it also learns the most useful features by itself. And so to give a, a, a hint of what this means, well, with traditional machine learning, if we talk about sequences as sentences as sequences, we have that 
each word is a unique feature so that all the words are represented by vectors that are orthogonal between each other. So there is no semantic, syntactic, or lexical similarity between words. On the other hand, deep learning learns a very powerful representation that is called word embedding, where similar words, similar in some sense, are represented by similar vectors. So this <coughs> means also that the task for the classifier is much easier because he knows once, once he learns on this representation of words, he knows a little bit that words are similar. So if he receives a house and apartment, he knows that it's the same concept. So it's easier. And this is what we are talking about when we say word embedding. There are a uh, lot of papers about word embedding from Google, from Stanford, from Joshua Benjo, that are the top ones in machine learning. And they discover that this vector can actually reason in some sense. So we have that the difference between king and queen is parallel to the difference between man and woman. And that there is also the same, the same analogy with verbal tenses and with the relationship with, with country and capital. So you see, <laughs> using deep learning gives us the opportunity to have a richer representation that allows the algorithms to know a little bit about the world even if we didn't we we're teaching by himself by ourselves so okay so let me uh, let me just say this that not all the leaders is gold and the goal of this talk is to give also some rule of thumbs on what are the downsides of going through deep learning with NLP and also when we think it's useful to use deep learning architecture and when it's not as useful. Uh, so this is the plan. We will go through recurrent neural networks, uh, in particular to bio-STMs for name identity recognition and to sex to sex for machine translation. And then I will talk a little bit about convolutional neural networks and variational open So I give the word to Maria for the central part and then I can so the idea of a current neural network is uh, the use of uh, sequential information. In the traditional neural network, we assume that all inputs and outputs are independent from each other. But for example, if we want to predict uh, the next word in the sentence, it's much easier if we know which uh, word came before it. So we use the current neural network since they, while computing the output, use both input and previous output. In the diagram, uh, A represents the current neural network, which takes as input uh, xt and output ht. And the loop allows the uh, information to go from uh, one uh, step of neural network to the next one. Uh, more precise, at the beginning, A takes as input x0 and uh, output h0. Then in the next step, it takes as input a0 and x1 and output h1. And then in the next step, it takes h1 and x2 as output and so on. So in general, a neural network helps us so whenever we have um, we need the, the information of previous input. The most common current uh, neural networks are the long short term memory networks, which are usually just called LSTMs. Uh, the memory of LSTMs is called the cell, and the LSTM has the ability of um, deciding what we keep uh, inside the memory and what we can uh, delete. Uh, this ability uh, is uh, we, for this ability we use uh, three different uh, functions. They are called gates. We have first one is uh, uh, gate uh, for get gate, and uh, this gate decides what uh, we will remove from the memory. Then we have uh, information gate, which decides uh, what uh, values we are going to update. And at the end, we have output gate, which decides what we are going to output. 
all of these uh, functions are learned by neural networks, so we don't need to worry about them. Uh, about architecture of the current neural network, there are five uh, types of uh, architecture. First, we have one to one, where both input and output have the length uh, equal to one. Then we have many to one, and the example is sentiment analysis. As input in sentiment analysis, we have some sentence, and for example, we want to predict if the sentence is positive or negative. So the output is uh, some number, for example, 0 or 1. Then, in addition to many to one, we have one to many. And at the end, we have uh, two types of many to many. The last one on the slide, many to many is the one where both input and output have the same length. And uh, the example is uh, named uh, MVP recognition. And uh, the, this one is uh, when uh, uh, input and output have different length. And the uh, example is machine translation where uh, both input and output are sequence, but they are uh, sentences, I'm sorry but uh, they are sentences from different uh, languages, so they can be of the different lines. As I said before, current uh, neural networks are used when the input is sequence, like, uh, for example, text in our case, or chatbot, and uh, when the order is important. The, oops, sorry. The two examples, of when we use the kernel networks are named as DC recognition and machine translation. So the goal of the named entity recognition is to give to each word in the sentence some uh, type like uh, head, which is the person, log for location, or for organization, GPA for geopolitical entity. And the architecture for named entity recognition is made from two parts. The first part is the word embedding, where each word is uh, presented as a vector which contains both the word characters embedding and word embedding. This means that word and characters are mapped into some real number with which a neural network can work. Then we have uh, bidirectional LSTM and the uh, conditional random field, uh, which takes as the input these embeddings. <coughs> when uh, we use uh, BLSTM, uh, we are running the input to two LSTMs. Uh, we, one reads the uh, sentence from left to right, and second one reads uh, from right to left. In this way, we have uh, for each word in the sentence uh, effect of previous word in the sentence and or effect of uh, the word uh, after that word. As uh, machine translation, uh, the task is to translate the sentence from one language to another language. And the uh, required neural network for machine translation are made from encoder and decoder. Encoder process uh, the word in a sentence and uh, compiles it into a vector of uh, uh, fixed length. It's the same idea as word embedding. And after processing the whole sentence, it sends uh, the vector to the decoder, which then uh, starts to output the sentence word by word. Uh, the idea of encoder is to find uh, the meaning of the sentence, while the idea of encoder is uh, to take that meaning and make the uh, translation. The problem of encoder and decoder is that uh, neural network needs to be able to compress all the necessary information to a vector of uh, fixed length and that can make a problem for very long sentences. So in addition to encoder-decoder, we have a tension mechanism, 
in a tension mechanism, we have uh, some weights like alpha iot, which, which tells us how much uh, tension we need to put to the iot word in the centers while we are computing the its output. And uh, in our chatbots, we don't use machine translation, but we use uh, uh, spell checking because uh, our training data set is completely grammatically correct. And it can happen that some person, while typing a sentence, makes some spelling check or grammar, or grammar, grammar grammatic mistake. So, to avoid the bad performances, we use spell checking, and for that we use the architecture similar to <coughs> machine translation. Since the difference between machine translation and spell checking is that in machine translation we translate sentence from one language to another, and in spell checking we are translating the wrongly written sentence to correct the sentence. And yeah. So uh, I will take about I will talk about other two architectures. There are probably less known for text, but are nonetheless very useful. And the first one is convolutional neural networks, which people from computer vision know perfectly well. But I will go through a little bit also by myself. And if I make some very bad mistake, just stop me because I'm not a guy from computer vision, so I might be saying some cool stuff. Okay. So the idea of convolution came from the task of classifying images and uh, an image can be represented by a matrix where each pixel where each pixel is represented by a numerical value that is the intensity of that pixel in that scale of color and the idea of convolution is to use a filter which is just a smaller metric this one to go through the image from top left to top right and then uh, slide one row and then go again and the idea is that this filter is actually a smaller matrix that has some weights that are learned by the uh, neural network and uh, the idea is that uh, using different different filters each filter will uh, uh, learn to activate itself in the presence of some useful information for the classifier for example if we are trying to detect whether in an image there is a plant or a bird one filter can activate itself if, if it sees an eye and another filter can activate itself if it sees a pea or something like that or a leaf or something like that so once you go through this uh, with enough filters and on top of the convolution you do other convolution that are less explainable let's say you can train a classifier on these learned features uh, and the idea that, that makes them very powerful is that whether there is uh, an eye or uh, a leaf is the important information and it's not, in, it's not relevant where in the image there is this information so if I, if I see an eye on the top right corner or in the bottom left it makes no difference for the convolutional neural network while for example if you were to run like fully connected layers it makes a difference so this gives the possibility to uh, generalize better it also has some downsides, for example, if you have two eyes, one on top of each other and the nose on top of that, it will surely predict that it's a face. And yeah, to, do, to uh, prevent this, there are some new architecture that are called capsule, capsules by Joe Clinton, but I will not go through in detail, because we will talk about neural network for text. And the idea is that also a sentence can be represented by a matrix. As we said, there are, we are working with word embeddings that are vectors of fixed length that represent words. So we can create a matrix representing a text by just stacking on top of each other the word embeddings of each word, which are, by the way, learned by the same neural network. And then we use convolution in the same exact way, almost, as we did for images. The difference is that while I was explaining for uh, for images, the filter was very small, like 3 by 3 pixel, and was going left to right. Here it doesn't make sense to go left to right, because the unit of meaning for the image is the pixel, 
while here is the whole vector where there is no point in like going through different parts of the word embedding and looking for patterns there. We look word, we look for patterns between the, se the sequence of words. So the convolution is like a bigger matrix which takes the whole row and just goes top down. Mm. Uh, and this is like my takeaway of the night on when to use convolutional neural networks and when not for text classification. And of course, the, the pro is that it can capture very complex situations. For example, imagine that the, there is a review and the, it says the food was not bad. And here, the information that is positive is completely hidden by the syntax, by the fact that we, we have three negative words that together in this order makes a positive affirmation. And the put was bad instead is negative. So this is where convolutional neural networks are really, really powerful. And in fact, they work really well on short sentences. And the downside is that it requires a lot of data, like hundreds of thousands of data. And it's less useful with uh, longer texts. And this is for like a very, very uh, natural uh, reason, is that if with longer text, for example, we are talking about document classification in, uh, into topics, then the, the information on what this uh, document is talking about is no longer hidden in the syntax, but by some keywords. For example, if I have soccer, if I have Ronaldo, these are the information I want to look for with an, with an algorithm. So there's like uh, naive base, actually, which does exactly this, looks for keywords uh, by itself, actually mm -hmm. overachieves and performs much better than convolution neural network with like uh, a hundred of the effort or a thousand of the effort. And yeah, it's super, super dumb, actually, uh, as an algorithm. Instead, if the information is hidden in the syntax, we have that convolution neural networks perform much, much better than all possible state-of-the-art algorithms like SVMs, like Forest, <coughs> like XGBoost, they perform really, really bad because they have the information of the relative ordering of the words. And yeah, let me conclude the, the talk with variational autoencoders, which is kind of my favorite subject, but it's quite hard to understand. So uh, there are three words on the slide, and I will explain all, all the three of them. But starting from the last one and going reading like uh, for Hebrew from right to left. So let's go with an encoder. Uh, and an encoder is something that learns a meaningful representation. For example, we were talking about word embeddings. We never explained how the, the, these are made. And this is the first architecture of word embedding produ uh, produced by uh, Joshua Benjo, I think, in 2002. Uh, the idea is that uh, we want to learn some vectors that are the, the rows of these. Uh, orange matrix, such that similar words are represented by similar vectors. And we start with words represented as distinct entities. For example, here each word is represented by a very long vector, where uh, it's the size of the vector, the size of the vocabulary, it can be 100,000, 200,000, 500,000. And there is, it's all empty, except for one, one in one position, which represents the unique word. Uh, and so this matrix in, is initialized at random and then you work through a supervised uh, classification problem or prediction problem you want to predict the next word given some context for example here you want to predict cool given word embeddings R and the idea is that by doing so you will see like uh, the, the paradigm is the uh, the one by Perth, that similar, uh, the words are characterized by the company they keep. So that similar words will be around other similar words, and every, so the similar words will be represented by similar vectors. Okay, let's go to the autoencoder part. <coughs> An autoencoder is just a way of learning the identity function, which is a really dumb task, and, and nobody wants to learn the identity because it's trivial. But there is a constraint. For example, here we want to map an image to the same image, but going through a much, much smaller space. So the idea of neural of autoencoder is to keep important uh, information in this compressed space or latent space, depending on your 
computer scientist of the network mathematician. And you will be able to uh, have one neural network that goes from the image to the latent space, and it's the one that does the compression. And then you have the other one that does the decompression part. And if you are good, then you have like a lossless compression because you can represent images with like three points and be able to still have like a, a mapping from three points to an image. Of course, this is not real, but you can get to some degree of closeness if you increase not to three points, but maybe 10,000. And the variational part is the revenge of Bayesian statisticians because yeah, so we have this uh, latent space, which nonetheless we cannot characterize very much. Uh, vector living there, they have some distinct from the probability distribution, which we don't know. We don't know which, what is the law. We don't know if we change if what one for the sorry, if one value is extreme given this uh, space, because we don't know which distribution is characterized. So the idea of variational encoder is that you want some structures in this unit space. And uh, by structure, I mean a uh, normal Gaussian with uh, independent features because we are also uh, uh, into computation and normal, uh, normal, uh, normal, uh, normal distribution with independent features makes really easy computation. And so you mm -hmm. minimize both the reconstruction loss and the mapping from the input image to this latent space. Uh, Let's see some of the applications that variational autoencoders are useful for. For example, uh, document cluster. We want to uh, get documents that talk about the same topics. And the idea is that we map documents into a latent space of n topics. We decide how many topics. And the fact that the, the distribution is uh, normal with uh, identity as covariance metrics means that the topics are uncorrelated. It might not be true, actually, if we talk about soccer and tennis, it might be correlated. But these are uh, our take, and this is what we work on. And the encoding part is to learn the topic <coughs> distribution context, and the decoding part is to learn to produce documents given some topic distribution. And this is uh, actually, a paper by Geoffrey Eaton uh, that was the first one to propose variational autoencoders for text. And he did exactly this. He did document clustering. And you can see this is the, was the state of the art clustering before. You can see that all the documents are brought together. There is no structure in the document. If we go instead to uh, 10 dimensional, uh, so we, we map into a 10 dimensional uh, multivariate React Gaussian. We see, and then we use like TSD for visual, visualizing this, uh, this space. We see that all the topics are really, really well separated from each other, and they make sense. And he also used this mm. for uh, information retrieval or document retrieval, of course. What is the algorithm used in B? Ah, uh, it's latent semantic analysis. Um, so here he, com he compares the performance of an autoencoder with 10 uh, hidden states and with uh, LSA with 50 dimension used. You can see that the, the autoencoder actually beats the LSA in the task of document retrieving. So he maps all the documents into this space and then he maps the queries into the same space with the same encoder or the composition that you learn through uh, LSA. Uh, SVD, that's it. and he does like cosine similarity between these vectors, and you can see that there is a huge memory saving if you go with both encoders. So yeah, uh, one thing I want to say is that we use this for document for like query clustering. Once we have like the queries that are not understood by the chatbot, maybe because they are not in the knowledge base, then we go through with an auto encoder and we can learn some approximate clusters. And this gives us the ability to structure the knowledge that we have. So it's really important. And so yeah, let me just finish the talk, this is the last slide, with some of my takes on uh, deep learning. So I really like deep learning because it's really flexible and it's adaptable and it gives you the possibility to focus on deep, doing deep learning research instead of doing like a lot of small areas research, which is really cool. And uh, yeah, um, 
most of the all the state of the art performances in all NLP tasks are achieved through deep learning, so it's really powerful. And also, if you are implementing the stuff, there is a huge community of support for like PyTorch and TensorFlow software. You just have the code that doesn't run or doesn't do what it's work, what it's supposed to do, and you just post the code, and some guy will randomly run it and say, "Yeah, you have a typo there." So it's really cool. Uh, and the cons are that it's expensive, both from the time point of view, because you have to have like skilled people that know what they're doing and you have to pay them to develop your uh, deep learning architecture while, for example, if you use LSA, it's like one line of code, everybody can do it. Everybody, a computer can do it. Uh, and also, you have to have GPUs because otherwise it's gonna take years for the algorithms to convert. So it's very expensive. Uh, you have to hire people that are good and give them the proper software and the hardware. And if you care about interpretability, so you want to say, yeah, my model is learning this, for like SBAs, uh, even random forest, it's really easy to understand what the, the, where the information is coming from for your class study. Uh, for deep learning, you have to, yeah, there's no way you can do it. Uh, and in most real world cases, as support vector machines are really, really tough to beat. So yeah, they should take uh, into account whether for like a 5% marginal, marginal gain it's worth spending some from thousands of euros into, into deep learning. And yeah, this is an image I found online. I do not... What? Andrew Yeah, probably. Yeah, probably it's Andrew Energy. Uh, so yeah, last time I showed it, it was like a shitstorm on me because mm -hmm. there is no axes and no like thresholds. Uh, but uh, I, don't, I didn't find anything better. So this was by Andrew Ng, so he knows what he's talking about, so I trust him. Uh, but yeah, so with the uh, increasing data sizes, then you can afford also, it makes sense to try to go with deep neural network. If you have limited data size, then it doesn't make any sense. Also, not only because you will spend a lot of time on it and you will spend a lot of money on it, but because the, the results you're gonna achieve, they're not worth it. So, yeah. Uh, what is the methods that you are using for the model? Yeah, as I said, uh, I have no, no clue of the, this. is a picture drawn by hand by some, uh, one of the most genius, one of the biggest genius in the planet. So I trust him, but uh, I'm just reporting what he says. Yeah, it's marketing. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, there you have my email. Uh, drop me a line if you're curious about something or, I don't know, or whatever, and we'll be around all night. Thank you. Anche in italiano. Sì, anche in italiano, perché Maria è serba, quindi. L'abbiamo fatto tutto in inglese. Perché avete scelto un training set di sole parole corrette? Uh, no, allora non dipende da noi, uh, nel senso che molto spesso i clienti ci mandano dei training set già strutturati così, uh, perché sono stati uh, scritti da persone appositamente per creare un chat. Quindi si mettono lì, pensano, ok, questi sono i 300 intenti che noi vogliamo supportare, allora mettono dei cristiani a scrivere. Quindi preparano loro a mano il. Esatto. <ride> esatto, esatto. E quindi non avrebbe senso introdurre rumore artificialmente nel, nel training set, quanto piuttosto cercare di ridurlo una, al, al momento della previsione. Quindi voi lavorate su dei dataset che sono scritti a mano con una domanda e risposte? Da... Uh, sì, la maggior parte sì, esatto. Poi abbiamo avuto anche degli esperimenti uh, no, quindi non supervisionati su cui c'è un po' più di deep learning e di ricerca da fare però sì, la maggior parte dei clienti strutturano i, i chatbot esclusivamente per questo scopo e il risultato end user è soddisfacente? sì, beh, Gianluca sicuramente ha delle metriche più recenti delle mie però no. penso... Eh, sì, allora, dipende sempre dal caso d'uso e da come è stato costruito il nostro grande lavoro nonostante sia molto tecnico più grande differenza del mondo perché per ottimizzare poi tutta la classificazione statistica devi passare al messaggio corretto di utente. Quindi vuol dire che devi settare bene le aspettative all'inizio, devi definire bene il problema 
l'obiettivo, sono tutte cose che passano sempre in secondo piano per il cliente, però in realtà fanno tutta la differenza in mondo. Perché se l'utente ha una percezione sbagliata di quello che effettivamente può ottenere all'interno dell'assistente virtuale, le metriche poi saranno basse. Magari non è una colpa tecnologica, semplicemente perché è stato il progetto domani. Quindi a livello di clienti dipende sempre poi come è arrivata alla fine la progettazione, nel senso che ci sono delle proposte che possono essere validate dal cliente stesso, che poi certe volte può scegliere anche non muovere la scelta corretta, però questo poi è abbastanza male, dipendente da caso a caso. Allora, noi chiediamo in alcuni casi la metrica sulla valutazione delle, delle performance. Nel caso di Bagno, ad esempio, abbiamo raggiunto uh, circa un tanto per tutto. 5% dei messaggi e delle conversazioni che ha fatto la testa virtuale ha avuto un massimo numero della scala quando abbiamo visto il video. Poi dipende da caso a caso, ovviamente, anche dalla tipologia di comunicazione che voglia fare, non come strutturare, però tendenzialmente le performance sono sufficienti. Però vi interfaccio nei clienti sufficientemente in modo da trovare i dati corretti o in generale? In generale. Il problema è che qui è per fare questo lavoro tu hai bisogno di che eh, il cliente eh, diventi un tuo partner. Assolutamente. Ecco, eh, lì andrai a scontrarti con la realtà, che cioè, il cliente diventa un partner, eh, tutto un insieme di informazioni che non ha, non è abituato a lavorare in un certo modo, molto spesso come sono succede anche in altre parti di progetti complessi di linguaggi, no? eh, vai a sbattere su questo. Oh, ci sono... <ride> Ci sono secondo me un po' di problemi in questo, in questo senso. Allora, la prima cosa, quando andiamo da un cliente, la maggior parte dei casi, come credo che a me e a chiunque qua dentro, sta parlando di Black Magic. Quindi d'altra parte c'è cioè, il proprio Black Magic. Cioè, sì, sì, sì. Stiamo facendo magia nera e non hanno la minima comprensione di quello che posso fare. Esatto. Seconda cosa, le barriere di ingresso per l'utilizzo degli strumenti di questo tipo sono bassissime. Bassissime vuol dire che ci sono una maniera di software online dove fare un chatbot che magari funziona solo per bottoni. Okay. Però tendenzialmente il cliente che ragiona pensando che, sia meglio. pensando che tu stia facendo Black Magic non ha la percezione di capire la differenza. Quindi alla fine si trovano davanti due prodotti, uno fatto con Chat Fuel e un altro fatto con esatto. Chat come il nostro, che hanno la stessa, si, si mostrano allo stesso modo perché l'interfaccia bianca, stringa di testo da parte di un civile, non c'è nessuna differenza. Ma è anche vero il cliente che effettivamente con un studio approfondito inizia veramente a interagire con una struttura. E quindi questo è il secondo problema che c'è in mezzo. E quindi sommando. Sommando, sommando queste cose è difficile poi arrivare a uh, allineare bene il cliente con i tuoi stessi obiettivi, che poi sono anche i suoi obiettivi, perché devi fare il suo, il suo successo. Questa cosa si fa lavorando tanto con loro, quindi da una parte c'è un lavoro di education che noi dobbiamo fare necessariamente quando approcciamo e partiamo con il cliente, dall'altra parte va accompagnato, quindi vanno prese persone anche molto operative, perché spesso per questa cosa non la si può fare, in realtà bisogna sempre intervistare e parlare con le persone che hanno il contatto diretto con gli esseri umani dall'altra parte, perché sono anche loro ad avere percezioni di quello che chiedono, se lo chiedono, se non lo fanno. Spesso chi è anche un il manager non ha la minima idea di cosa funziona. Quindi vanno portati a bordo loro e poi portati a bordo loro sono loro i primi a pubblicarsi affinché la cosa funzioni bene. Quindi eh, c'è un grande lavoro di convincimento all'inizio. In realtà questa è una cosa che abbiamo scoperto sbattendo la testa un sacco di volte. Quindi volta dopo volta sbattendo la testa, sbattendo la testa capisci che il processo migliore è magari questo. Quindi abbiamo perfezionato il corso del tempo e ora siamo anche veloci e bravi e poi grazie a Dio abbiamo per i qui è abbastanza importante, quindi quando andiamo da un nuovo cliente abbiamo anche la fiducia per poterlo fare. Quindi questo fa tutta la differenza. A livello di chatbot utilizzate sempre la stessa architettura, tipo sequence to t sequence model, o variate nel, da cliente a cliente, da chatbot a chatbot? Ah sì, è completamente <coughs> customizzabile, nel senso che se uno arriva e ti dice ok abbiamo un milione di esempi, allora certo sono il primo che vuole fare una sequence to sequence, divertire. Se uno viene là e ti dice oh tieni ho 400 esempi in 300 classi, allora magari faccio una in base. Mm. Quindi sì esatto, dipende mm. molto da, da quanti dati può produrre il cliente, da come sono strutturati i dati. Quindi e... sono sempre personalizzati sul dataset che vi offre il cliente. Esatto. 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 Avete realizzato solo interazioni testuali o anche attraverso voce? No, per ora, penso... per ora si può fare, nel senso il framework è indipendente, è indipendente dal canale, e, quindi si può fare, nessuno dei nostri clienti ha mai avuto tanto traffico, <ride> ma mettendo, mettendo magari un, 
un ASR in mezzo, un riconoscimento vocale. Sì, no, non c'è cioè, il vocale in testo, poi il testo viene mandato in sistema. Quello si potrebbe fare. Cioè non viene analizzato direttamente l'audio. Esatto. No. Eh, ah beh, hanno aperto le PI ieri. Eh, mm. Sì, 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 agganciando Google eh, Speech to Text e Text to Speech si può fare un assistente vocale. Eh, certo, poi c'è l'errore, cioè si vanno a sommare gli errori, no? Comunque sono tutte cose probabilistiche. Se speech to text capisce male, allora anche il chat capirà male e text to speech traduce male perché, non so, perché sbaglia una parola, allora si va... Cioè, andando a spacchettare, uh, moltiplichi le probabilità di errore per, per le singole. Per un'architettura end-to-end voice, no, però ci sono i dati, il tempo e... Scusi, i clienti che ti avete parlato hanno chat semplici che possono essere dimenticati e per anche assolutamente eh? allora magari quando mi metto il vaccino che dovrei decidere un elenco che così possiamo andare a vedere a toccare con mano eh? se un topic il eh, modello di business attuale non parliamo di cifre ma di modello software as a service che si sì. fa per finanziare per la soluzione del servizio per l'intenzione e c'erano due domande, una e due, poi il resto tutto. Le immagini sono le vostre, il pacchetto diciamo c'è uno stazzato lì e poi è a consumo, ci sono un po'. Scusi, i canali, Messenger, Telegram, qualsiasi canale con mm. uh, le app di whatsapp ancora non sono, non sono state rilasciate per il business qui io ho le api sì. ma tra l'altro ah, no, no, interfacciato attraverso microsoft attraverso microsoft attraverso azure fate l'aggancio ai canali o piuttosto li realizzate voi in volta in volta la parte di interfacciamento cioè abbiamo una libreria che fa solo l'interfacciamento con ah. i sistemi quindi agganciamo lì poi dopo è indipendente tutto il resto che avviene dopo quindi ci agganciamo qualsiasi cosa che il cliente vuole quindi alla fine iniziamo in maniera opportunistica a mappare tutti i canali Chiaro. però alla fine abbiamo oltre poi le applicazioni messaggistiche abbiamo anche realizzato l'interfaccia web proprietaria quindi nessun login la, la soluzione più semplice è quando il cliente vuole essere inclusivo quindi vuol dire che non vuole limitare l'accesso a chi è preventivamente logato non vuole andare su Facebook quindi in quel caso lì arriva la web e infine poi API classica, quindi qualsiasi applicazione messaggistica per il cliente stesso che ci vuole. Ok, ancora su queste due domande e le altre dopo durante il networking. Mi capita spesso o raramente di dover gestire il testo multilingua? Eh, allora, abbiamo, sono partiti i primi progetti internazionali adesso, quindi eh, quello per Superlim e quello per Microsoft. Eh, quindi al momento per quelli italiani no. E per questi qua sì, nel senso poi gestiamo le varie lingue che probabilmente all'interno della stessa chat che il cliente lo richiede. Quindi... Mi chiedevo se avessi provato a utilizzare le embeddings eh, in algoritmi tradizionali tipo su Corvette Machine e nel caso che strategie utilizzate per combinare sì, gli allora, dei nomi. Eh... Allora c'è un paper molto buono che si chiama Simple but Tough to Beat Baseline for Sentence Embedding che eh, sostanzialmente fa una, una media pesata degli embedding per eh, ottenere l'embedding di una frase lo fa per tutti meno lag in vector la prima esatto, persona. quindi lo sai e anche lì tra l'altro mi dovrebbe chiederti come fai però per rimuovere il primo lag in vector nel caso di un line in batch eh, ma per esempio in una domanda posso dire Beh, comunque tu hai una parte di training in cui ti calcoli il primo item vector. Quindi una parte di training in cui ti arrivano tutte le, eh, tutte le domande, no? Perché se non hai training, di se non hai un training set, di fatto non, non facciamo reinforcement ancora, quindi anche perché non è molto safe come, come strategia. Eh, quindi nel momento in cui iniziamo da qualche migliaio di domande, possiamo crearci questa mega batch, eh, questa matrice in cui abbiamo... 10.000 domande per la dimensione del, del vettore, facciamo la composizione del valore singolare della matrice trasposta, prendiamo il primo vector e quello poi è chissà. Se poi vogliamo 
una volta che abbiamo altre 10.000 domande dobbiamo rifare un training di fatto, non c'è un modo per... Cioè, la decomposizione ai valori singolari è un operatore lineare, quindi uno potrebbe anche scomporlo di volta in volta, però lo dobbiamo ancora provare. Eh, però sì, questo è. Eh, poi ci sono altre strategie, nel senso che c'è la world movers distance, per combinare la. Eh, per trovare direttamente la distanza fra due frasi date gli embedding delle parole. È una bomba dal punto di vista computazionale, nel senso che uno è un è un algoritmo di ottimizzazione eh, iterativo, quindi per ogni, per ogni coppia di frasi devi, devi far girare un algoritmo di ottimizzazione, non è proprio... Eh, no, 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 questo prende praticamente eh, eh, parole, ogni parola è associata a un embedding e vede come sta cercando di minimizzare la distanza fra coppie di parole o coppie e una parola, ad esempio. Eh, funziona eh, se vai a fare un clustering sulle frasi con questa word movers distance funziona eh, ci mette oh, una settimana eh, tranquillamente eh, quindi eh, sentence embedding è un problema aperto sicuramente cioè, dipendono molto dai, dai task se stai facendo machine translation eh, sentence embedding è facile se stai facendo eh, se non hai una, una, un benchmark o un uh, test set o comunque una, una funzione obiettivo ben definita con degli esempi da, per, per fare la back propagation allora sentence embedding è ancora un mistero eh, sì, ci stiamo, è uno dei temi di ricerca di fatto, che, che abbiamo eh, Matteo qua, quindi sarà a lavorare 5 no? quindi se fra un paio di mesi avete domande sui sentence embedding lui saprà rispondere <ride> Okay. Grazie. Grazie.